And if we want now to get on to the future. Uh, Julian, if you want to uh, join the conversation, I'm going to uh, walk on over. He's my neighbor. Uh -huh. Come over and uh, they, then you will share the screen here. Sure. Okay. Great. I don't know if you'll do that. And folks, um, lots to discuss. And for our top news, China promises to no new coal-fired pro uh, power projects abroad. We think that could be very significant. In technology, how about this? Researchers have developed a fully autonomous robot chef. In the environment, the story is that avoiding a climate disaster will require a new industrial revolution. This one doesn't cut it. Under materials, there's a new optical transistor that speeds up computation by up to a thousand times, and that's at lowest switching energy. This can result in 20 more years of the Moore's Law doubling uh, computer power every uh, two years. It'll take some time to get up to that, but wow. Now on space. <clears throat> Heck of a ride. SpaceX's historic amateur astronauts splash down safely in the Atlantic. In biology, groundbreaking bacteria killing viruses unite with antibiotics to fight devastating antibiotic resistant bacteria. For humans, us, eat the rich, why millennials and Generation Z have turned their backs on capitalism. And for our last story uh, on health, medicine, the mind diet apparently is linked to much better cognitive performance. So that's what we'll discuss today. And now, Richard, what's this in our top story that China promises to no new coal-fired power projects abroad? Now, this is uh, significant for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is presently, of course, China is the biggest polluter in the world. And not only is China the biggest polluter in the world within China, they are also presently the biggest funder in the world of uh, coal-fired plants in other places besides China. So uh, this is a big step for them. And to have a chance with our uh, climate war, we need to have China really stepping up to the bar. So that's, I think, the overall significance of this. Uh, then recently, the China uh, Xi Jinping had addressed the UN General Assembly and said, quote, China will step up support for other developing countries in developing green and low carbon energy and will not build new coal-fired plants abroad. That's a pretty flat statement. Uh, China has been under heavy diplomatic pressure for months to end this coal financing and it actually follows similar announcements from South Korea and Japan. The three of them together were responsible for financing more than 95% of uh, the overseas coal-fired uh, electricity plants in the world. So having these three together say no more is uh, something that is pointing to the end of coal. Coal is still much more popular in Asia than it is in uh, the Americas or in Europe, 
and coal is still uh, being used to generate a lot of in electricity in Asia and in fact the Asians use three quarters of the world's coal so that's and so in China while they are eliminating funding of coal plants outside of uh, China inside China they uh, put online about 40 gigawatts of new coal power which looks like it's about three quarters of the world's new coal plants were built in China. Uh, China is doing this uh, because after the COVID epidemic where their business slowed down uh, they are getting more business now and people are ordering stuff and they need more energy to make more uh, plastic junk for Walmart. So anyway, China is now uh, starting to take uh, actual steps that matter and I think that that's good news for all of us. Any thoughts? Well, at the net result, if they're building more uh, coal power plants internally, almost as much as they would externally, the net result would be about the same, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like what they're doing is to uh, pull up the drawbridge. Now they're okay. They've they've uh, kind of got all the electric power generation they need, and uh, to heck with anybody else. <laughs> well, it's easy to be cynical about their announcement, certainly. Uh -huh. It's easy to be cynical, but is that not the same as the West? No, it seems pretty similar. Uh, what we've heard about the West is the West has made lots of promises of uh, what they're going to do, and the action is far short of the promises, and the promises aren't enough. And historically, uh, it's in the West uh, particularly in the States and in Europe, that we've caused all these problems. Right, the, particularly in the States. I think the U.S. was by far the biggest contributor. Now, what, I guess about a decade ago, uh, China took over as number one. Well, I, I think that probably one of the reasons that China is doing what it's doing is because it's come to the realization that coal power is really non-competitive or not competitive with other sources of power, mm -hmm. uh, like the sun. And, uh, and of course, they didn't know that until uh, you know we uh, we managed to uh, to find a way to capture the power of the sun. So now they're replacing uh, the, uh, the 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 use of coal. The power from the sun. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, people that want to be just nice to the world, uh, but uh, they, you know, they an awful lot of uh, work for the world. I know that, uh, and they were coming very independent. Uh, you know, my uh, my son worked for a company who, uh, and he's with uh, a manufacturer in China uh, for have been for at least 20 years and uh, for some reason or another they're not happy with the financial arrangement of his company uh, they're making a, a kind of radio uh, for them and so they have put in this company this, uh, my company some company uh, I noticed that uh, they need to make this stuff uh, until and including December, and then that's it. And apparently, they 
are not able to uh, to get them back, so they're scrambling to find somebody else. And we're not talking about a little bit. I mean, this is thirty million dollar uh, product line. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, that's, that's really something that the manufacturer can say, uh, "Go, go fly a kite." Now, also, one of the things about China in coal is that China has a health system that I think is mainly funded by the government. And uh, in places where they are studying it now, they are saying the environmental costs of air pollution in terms of health is enormous and in most places in the world uh, the cost for health is higher than the cost of fixing the problem. I think that also may be something that is in the long term driving China's action because they have a problem of their own that is yeah. substantial. Yeah, most likely. Okay. Well, moving on from uh, college philosophy courses. What's this about a robot chef? Well, uh, it could be interesting. Let me see. This one, I got some uh, audio visual assistance. Here is the little guy, and it's a chef in a dome, and in the middle, I believe, is the 3D printer. And I'm not sure what all those little things are around it. Maybe they are elements for different ingredients or something. And uh, so this, uh, what they're trying to do, this is uh, Columbia's Creative Machine Lab. And they are trying to build a fully autonomous digital personal shift. And they have been developing 3D printed food since 2007. You know, I hadn't even considered 3D printed foods a dozen years ago, but they've been working on it that long. And food printing, they say, has moved along uh, significantly, and they have many more ingredients and things that they can include within it. And uh, they had figured out that they're able to produce ingredients with uh, very fine precision with this 3D printing. But there was a problem in making a food system for the home. And that problem was to be able to heat it up with the same kind of precision that they can print it. And they had the clever idea, how about lasers? And so uh, that's what they have been working on. And here I have another thing for you guys. A process and has been for centuries. Most foods are cooked using an oven, a stovetop, or over an open flame. But here we explore a new heating technique laser cooking. But can food be cooked on the inside using lasers? We use chicken as a model food system. We pureed the raw chicken in a food processor and extruded it using our 3D food printer. Current cooking techniques don't provide high spatial resolution, but we need high precision to properly cook 3D printed foods. We demonstrate the ability to cook foods at a millimeter scale with three different types of lasers. A blue laser operating at 445 nanometers, a near infrared laser operating at 980 nanometers, and a mid infrared laser operating at 10.6 microns. We use the cooking pattern that can be easily adjusted to optimize the heating conditions for chicken. By tuning parameters such as circle diameter, circle density, path length, randomness, and laser speed, we can optimize the distribution of energy that hits the surface of the food with higher resolution than conventional heating methods. We can even create checkerboard or more complex lace heating patterns that are not possible with conventional cooking. Unlike convection heating in an oven, laser boiling provides pulsed heating as it propagates across the surface of the food. 
there's an implicit trade-off between speed and amplitude of the energy pulse, which is only limited by the total power of the laser. By varying the number of passes of the laser from four passes to one continuous pass, we can compare real-time temperature with maximum recorded temperature and deduce the heating efficiency of different cooking patterns. Compared to oven broiling, we found that laser-cooked foods are more moist and shrink less after heating. Energy from visible and near-infrared lasers also pass through clear plastic mediums, giving us the ability to cook and brown foods within their original packaging. Most importantly, we found that different wavelengths of light can cook foods to different depths. In other words, blue lasers are better for penetrative cooking, while infrared lasers are best for browning. Multiple laser wavelengths should be combined for best cooking results. In the end, laser cook samples were edible and achieved food safe temperatures for consumption. This technology is the first step in digitizing the cooking process and is poised to change the way we cook and think about foods. Okay, now uh, the one thing I noticed about the video is at the end, uh, he didn't praise the eating quality uh, that much. He said, it's edible. But so how's that for your cooking? So here you can have your, you can have your chicken and print it too. And so uh, this shows that uh, the potential of uh, a change in your lifetime. This is not like the Star Trek replicator, but I guess this is as close as we're going to get to it. There's still a problem, though, in uh, rolling this kind of technology out. One of the problems is that uh, we can't go to the supermarket and get our little uh, food packets to put in our printer or however <laughs> we put the ink in the printer. And another problem is that uh, there's not the sustainable kind of uh, technological ecosystem to support it. Uh, one of the things we don't yet have is food computer-aided design systems, which we certainly will need to have if one of these is in everybody's kitchen. And then, you know, we need good user-friendly software so you and I can uh, gin up our... Uh, home cooked uh, laser printed uh, laser cooked food uh, and they don't have the kind of ability to be able to share recipes and file digital recipes like they do like we share music but uh, this points to maybe a different future <coughs> Would you like to have one of these things on your table? Uh, they say one of the things that is wonderful about it is that you can use, of course, it can deposit spices. So you can have the each meal flavored exactly the way that you want. And your wife can have it the way she wants. And... Uh, Nobody has to stay in the kitchen doing all the work. Are you ready to buy yours yet? Any thoughts? Well, uh, the, uh, the kitchen would certainly look different with all these laces. And um, it doesn't say how much they cost or how long time it takes. But um, maybe for Sunday. Right. I think this must be sort of like when microwave ovens started coming around too. I mean, I'm sure people at that point were thinking, geez, why would I want to use a microwave to cook my food? That's right. Try to get do it without it. But here, imagine if you had something like this and you're a working family and uh, 
you know, you know uh, you're going to get home before six and everybody needs to unwind a little bit. And uh, because you want to get the kids to bed early, you know, you want to feed them at 630 and you can figure out what the cycle process cycle time is for your food and just have it uh, cook it while you're uh, coming home and have it fresh waiting for you piping hot at the moment you want it. The thing is they're talking about chicken for instance and uh, chicken uh, as far as I I have seen the latest is they come with bones you know and they don't remove themselves by themselves. Uh -huh. So, so I, I don't think it's going to work quite as that's, easy. That's part of the infrastructure system. I can imagine, you know, if you have a 3D printer, uh, at least when I saw them uh, years ago at Fry's Electronics in California, there was a section that you would go to in the store that had all these different 3D printing materials. And so if you were interested in doing it, you would get uh, sticks of this or that that you would use in your printer. And for this to be successful, then you have to be able to get your little package of chicken. Because I'm not going to grind up the chicken to put in my 3D printer. I don't know about yeah. you. <laughs> now, I could see it being uh, worth doing sort of fast food outlet. And, uh, you know, where they're producing a certain small range of things and they get them all consistent. But... Uh, when you're doing it at home, you are adjusting for the different qualities of the ingredients. I mean, we find that sometimes five minutes in the microwave will cook bacon, but sometimes you have to give it an extra minute, you know. <laughs> well, again, there are problems. There are always problems with new technology, but... I think I think that's a supply problem because if you just have consistent ingredients, then you can have consistent processes. So it's merely a matter of getting your supply chain in line. It's sort of interesting because you know so many people are are really worried about too much processed food these days and trying uh -huh. to get away from processed food and, and cooking it yourself. And so I'm wondering if. If people will, I mean, this is a lot of processing. Well, it I'm depends. Wondering... Uh, you can do it. I'm sure you can use whole wheat. Yeah, you know, so that's good. Again, okay. if you have or, if you have the right green kind green. of ingredients, you can yeah. make the right stuff. I don't know about having uh, fresh green leafy vegetables, though, and I'm not <laughs> sure what broccoli would be like. Broccoli soup. <laughs> but 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 I think you know I think it's what's interesting to think about is if people do the processing themselves if it can be fast uh -huh. and somewhat consistent then they might accept more processed food as long uh -huh. if they have control over it themselves. Uh -huh. Anyway, it's yeah. interesting. I, I uh, go ahead. Yeah. I've noticed that I've noticed that supermarkets. They sell an awful lot of uh, food that has been partially prepared. And all you have to do is bring it home and put it in the microwave or in the oven uh, according to the directions. And uh, I think that makes a lot more sense to me. If I was living on my own, I would make a lot more use of that. Uh-huh. The other thing about this is that uh, since everybody eats things that change our food technology affect the lives of all of us more than almost anything else. And also a part of that uh, is food is a social time and also is a cultural experience. So, you know, you would like to be able to have your programmable auto chef be able to make 
uh, Thai food or Chinese noodles or apple strudel, depending on where you're from. Anyway, interesting. I you think that we said their code uh, gun the machine it'll eat for you, so that way you can get done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want it to eat for me. That's a pleasure I want to keep for myself. I don't even want it to eat for me and send me the sensory signals to my brain. I want to taste them with my own tongue. <laughs> That's a lot. What's this about needing a new industrial revolution if we're to avoid climate disaster? Well, oops, the old one didn't work out so well. Uh, you could argue, in fact, that the last industrial revolution is what got us where we are here. But uh, this is a case of public advocacy by a well-known technology figure. It's Bill Gates. And Bill Gates is retired from Microsoft now, so I guess he's got to go out and save the world in his spare time. And uh, he is saying we do need a new industrial revolution to avoid climate disaster and, quote, half the technology needed to get to zero emissions either doesn't exist yet or is too expensive for much of the world to afford. And I think that's a fair statement and is pretty accurate. And what uh, Gates is doing about it in his own small way is uh, he, through his organization Breakthrough Energy, is funding uh, $1.5 billion in climate change projects if, and only if, Congress passes their $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. That's the little one. And uh, his funding will focus on direct air capture, zero emission fuel for planes, long-term energy storage, and green hydrogen. And he points out uh, that if the Infrastructure Act and Jobs Act becomes law, this collaboration between his spending and the $25 billion that the U.S. is going to spend on this kind of research will uh, help put us on a path to net zero. And it's also going to create a lot of immediate and long-term jobs in communities across the country. So uh, it certainly seems like a, a worthwhile effort. And I think he's announcing it uh, at the time he was announcing it, to put further pressure on the Congress to act. And from what I hear, it's possible that we will hear some things from the Congress this week. Let us hope so. Uh, the world depends upon you, uh, U.S. Congress and Joe Manchin and uh, Samina, so we're all looking at you. You better do the right thing. Excuse me. Any thoughts? Well, he wants to contribute about 1,000 or a little more than 1,000 of the 1. 1.2 trillion, which is right. It's good, but it's very, it's very peanuts. Nice. But it's uh, if you compare it to the 25 billion that the government is going to throw into research, he's that's the number you have to compare it to. So he's adding another crummy billion dollars into the pile. Now, the thing that he has the freedom that the government doesn't have, I think, in terms of choosing projects. And so one of the things that uh, can be immensely helpful is putting the money in the right places. and. You know, I'm actually glad that there are different entities that are thinking about how to do this because they will make different decisions and maybe one of them will be the right one. I think um, if it's got Bill Gates' his name on it, 
All the right wing nut jobs will be against it right from the beginning. <laughs> They'll be against it anyway, you know. Because yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not uh, subsidy for more oil wells. You know, I, I don't really think that the solution lies in technology, but rather in human cooperation. If you could accomplish that, uh, I think we can tackle climate change. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, some part of the world will have the money to buy electric cars for everyone and uh, do that kind of thing. But the majority of the world is going to be left behind. And uh, uh, it, it's going to work with technology. I, I think we just have to uh, find a way to uh, educate everyone. Well, the educating uh, everyone is something that has been going on very well in the last 50 years. And if you look at the percentage of the world population that is illiterate, it's cut. Uh, it has been cut enormously uh, in our lifetime. And so that's a, that's something that we're actually doing well and we're doing well in a lot of places or doing better. It is not so much literacy as it is an understanding and uh, uh, people cooperate that, uh, that, that cannot point to countries like the US and say, well, at least they have a fantastically good life and here we are you know, uh, hungry most of the time. Anyway, certainly I would never argue against people cooperating. I think that's uh, wonderful. And that's one of the ways that we can uh, deal with this stuff that is most effective. You're sure right there. So Richard, what's this about a transistor with speeds up computation by a thousand times? You know, this is going to be one of the things that I really eat up because this is the next part of what we can do with these integrated circuits that I've been involved in since uh, for the last 50 years. And so here an international research team led by Skoltech, whoever they are, and IBM has created an extremely energy efficient optical switch that can replace electronic transistors and they will make a new generation of uh, computers that instead of manipulating electricity will manipulate photons and uh, the this optical switch then uh, is very efficient. It doesn't need cooling. It can run at room temperature and it's up to a thousand times faster, a thousand times faster than today's commercial transistors. And uh, this gives it uh, immense power and it's, the reason it's so energy efficient is all that it takes to be able to turn this switch on and off is a few photons. You know, a photon is mighty little and a few photons aren't very many. And so it doesn't take much energy to be able to generate and use those photons. And the device itself actually consists of uh, two tiny lasers that uh, turn the switch on and off. And uh, the thing is, again, if you look at it a thousand times faster, Moore's law has had since the 1960s, these ICs getting more powerful on the average, basically doubling their speed and power every year. And if you get 
uh, a thousand times the speed, that's 20 years worth of this doubling every other year. So that's a big uh, advancement there. And also, in terms of the long term, this may be represent a kind of limit because doing this with uh, a few photons, it's hard to get it much smaller. Oh, and by the way, besides acting as a transistor, a transistor is used basically as a switch. You turn it on and off, and in one state it's a zero, and the other state it's a one. So this is the basis of digital electronics. It can also work as a communication component linking different devices by shuttling photons around. And in addition, I'm not sure uh, how this is done, it can work as an amplifier boosting the intensity of a uh, incoming laser beam by more than 20,000 times. And so uh, that is a lot of power. And the, to be able to do this, I think uh, we are going to be five or 10 years away, probably closer to 10 years away, because all, all you have to do to be able to use this technology is to be able to design and manufacture new chips. And uh, the design process would be using an entirely different methodology than they're using now. And the manufacturing process would be entirely different. The big chip plants now typically cost two or three billion dollars. And so these are massive scale operations and uh, changing radically an industry like this is going to take a while. But this gives us a lot of potential. The industry itself generates billions of dollars of profit every year and they have the money to invest to be able to do it and they have the incentive to make that investment. So I think this kind of technology will be one of the things that happens. You know, it's faster, it's more efficient, it's cheaper. How can it not be a winner? Any thoughts? Yeah, does that switch actually this ready? Or is it an idea? No, here they've been able to make they've been able to make the components. So they've been able to make the switch. Yeah, yeah it seems interesting. Yeah. I think uh, it will make machines have a very quick reaction time. And so uh, uh -huh. with AI applications and things like that, it's uh, it's, it's going to make it. It's going to make a difference. Mm. I think you're right. Now, I think also one of the places that it will make a difference right now, a fairly significant amount of the world's energy, maybe 10 percent of the world's electricity, is used to power computers and to store information. And if you can make the basic element here, the switch, is the basic element of that. If you can make the switch a hundred times more efficient, then the world's energy bill goes down big time. I think that it's also, with that kind of increase in speed, it's going to change the world as we know it. Uh, for example, in artificial intelligence and many other areas, yes. uh, it opens up very wide the possibilities. Yes, indeed. So, Richard, tell us about this heck of a ride of SpaceX's uh, amateur astronauts. <laughs> well, uh, they did have a heck of a ride. I just want to bring up... Uh, uh, a photo. Excuse me, it should have been there waiting for us. 
but I failed again as a Zoom administrator. And what did I do now? Did I blow up everything? Okay, well, the, this doesn't seem to be working, so let me just ignore it. I had a cool photograph of the four astronauts in space, but uh, we don't get to use it. So now the astronauts, these were civilians, these were four four, I don't know if you can call them astronauts anymore because NASA changed their rules on what you can call an astronaut. And now to be an astronaut, you not only have to go up in space, but you have to, the mission has to actually do something besides go around the planet. So uh, I think NASA changed the rules because of all these billionaires in space. But anyway, so it was two men, two women. Uh, they came down about a week ago into the ocean. Uh, they parachuted into the ocean just before uh, sunset. Uh, the SpaceX boats were there to uh, pull them out of the capsule and take them back to the land. So it was all very efficient. Uh, these are like the big missions we used to hear of during the days of NASA, except that no NASA people were involved. They took off from uh, Cape Canaveral, but it was they took off from a facility that SpaceX leased from the government so the, they didn't even provide them a place to take off. When they landed, the SpaceX mission controller greeted them saying, on behalf of SpaceX, I welcome you back to planet Earth. Your mission has shown the world that space is for all of us. And their mission commander, Jarek Isaacman said, Thanks so much, SpaceX. It was a heck of a ride for us just getting started. So anyway, this was an all amateur uh, plane crew going around and doing this orbiting, showing that the technology is now powerful enough and efficient enough and uh, controllable enough that you can go into space and come back and you don't even need to have a driver. So, uh, and uh, so it's a different world. And now because of this, uh, SpaceX is trying to look to the future. Uh, they already have booked several uh, flights carrying paid customers. I think the first is going to go up next year with three businessmen. And wait till you hear the price of the ticket. It's only $55 million each. Billion? So uh, the space is going to be for the rich except for occasional stunts like this where they put up uh, free people. Now the mission was uh, fairly trouble free but there was one problem that affected uh, all of these uh, amateurs in space and that is they had trouble with the toilet fan. <laughs> But other than that, it was an uneventful mission. Are you hey, ready boss. to go? No, I think I back and had all sprinkles all over. <clears throat> we couldn't quite hear you, John. Oh, I said, you know, Richard said that they have a problem with the toilet, right? So, the toilet fan. Uh, okay, so that's why I thought they could tell because they had... They came back, they had speckles all and over. So I think uh, the girls complained after the men went to the toilet, I bet. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, anyway. 
I'm going to imagine that's always been a problem because surely the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle and things like that, they were recycling the air all the time. I mean, <laughs> well, I have... uh, it's not only... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. All I was going to say is that um, I don't think uh, uh, incredibly fit, intelligent astronauts smell any better than uh, <laughs> the regular guys. Uh -huh. Now, I have heard <laughs> other stories of uh, toilet problems in space, and I'm not sure what the whole story is, but I believe weightless toilets uh, have several design problems. Yeah, it's a shitty problem, all right. <laughs> I, I don't think we need to concern ourselves until the flight, uh, the price of a space flight is the equivalent to a house. Even then, it would be a big decision to sell your house just for a space ride. <laughs> but how about the hundred people on Elon Musk's uh, mission to Mars? You know, they're all going to have to go potty. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't want the uh, mission to leave a trail of We'll call it debris behind. Yeah. Well, my my son tells me that Japanese toilets have like an air extractor. Uh -huh. uh, that uh, you know kind of solves a problem at source. <laughs> well, Richard, we've heard a lot about uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. And what's this about viruses united with antibiotics to fight these antibiotic re re resistant bacteria? Uh, I think my own opinion is this is uh, a brilliant attempt. And uh, the base of this is there is a kind of virus. I don't know if you're all familiar with it but they're called phages or bacteriophages, and they're the virus that kill bacteria. Did you know about those? We have a bunch of viruses in our gut, in our microbiome, and the kind of common kind of virus inside our stomach, in fact, are these phages. So they're part of this bacterial micro warfare that's going on all the time. And they had the clever idea to uh, look and see uh, what kind of antibacterial chemicals seem to be the most efficient uh, dealing against this particular bacterial species and uh, then combine it with a phage and see how they do together. And so they decided to test this combination uh, therapy and they tested it on zebra fish because zebra fish is immune system apparently is very similar to humans immune system. And so, uh, especially in terms of how the zebra fish respond to bacterial infections. And so anyway, here what they did is they infected the uh, fish with uh, serious infections that caused abscess and only about 20% of the fish survived that infection. So it was pretty serious for the zebra fish. Then they uh, gave them the best antibiotic that they could find against this particular 
uh, bacteria and the survival rate doubled which is pretty good. It went from 20% to 40%. Then, in addition, they uh, combined that with the bacteriophage and the uh, cure rate again almost doubled again. And so it went from 40% to 70%. And so this is a pretty strong indicator that this combination therapy is effective and you know I think of it is what they're really doing is using already nature's best weapon against bacteria which are these uh, viruses the, that attack bacteria and then just finding ways to enhance their performance. And so I think it's a brilliant idea, and I think we will hear in the future uh, more kind of combination therapies that are using uh, phages plus antibacterial activity to uh, go after uh, another broad range of bacterial infections. Any thoughts? I think it's a good idea, but we need to be extremely careful because, like, in the 19th century, we were introducing species into parts of the world where they never been before, and some of those results were, were disastrous. <laughs> sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So, Richard, moving on to uh, us. Why are millennials and Generation Z turning their backs on capitalism? Well, uh, the uh, quick line of it is that uh, young people really see no rational incentive to back a system that seems to offer little other than insecurity and crisis. So that's, that's the kind of summary. Uh, and it, the, in the 18th century, a philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, declared, quote, when the people shall have no more to eat, they will eat the rich. And uh, today, it turns out, you can find this phrase, eat the rich, all over Twitter and social media and on places like TikTok. And uh, these feature young faces then uh, protesting in different ways against capitalism. And these particularly are the millennials, those born in the early 80s through the mid 90s, and uh, what some people call the Zoomers, which are after the millennials. And they're not advertising violence, but there's something here that is deeper than just the latest internet meme. Uh, and I think it's exemplified by who is probably the world's present most famous left-wing millennial, AOC. And uh, she is a great example for uh, this generation's feeling in energy on capitalism. She was the one that went to the Met Ball, if you remember, and addressed emblazoned tax the rich. And so she's a totem for cool kids who uh, like their redistribution of wealth and power with a bunch of mainstream popular culture. And uh, her being at an event like that with a dress like that shows that now it's a different time and the elites cannot really escape the young flexing their, their political muscle. This gives me hope, actually. Uh, and this, the statistics here are for young Britons. I think 
it's going to be different in the U.S., but not dramatically different from what I've heard. Uh, the study they did of the Brits said of the young Brits, nearly 80% blame capitalism for the housing crisis that's been in Britain for more than the last 20 years. 75% believe the climate emergency is, quote, specifically a capitalist problem, and 72% back sweeping nationalizations, and 67% say they want to live under a socialist economic system. Uh, an example of the kind of thinking that is behind this is a young person saying, I was renting, thinking, how will I ever be able to afford a house? And for the young, they've concluded that the economic strategy that penalizes them, coupled with a culture war that denigrates their values, is essentially a war against their generation and it turns out they don't like it. And uh, in the UK, this is all exacerbated by uh, policies that came from Margaret Thatcher. In the 80s, she started to push for home ownership in Britain to, quote, resume the forward match of embourgeoisement with which went so far in Victorian times. But what happened with those good intentions is rather than the property-owning democracy buying all the houses, it became a landlord's paradise. So the rich guys were buying the houses and renting them so much that these young people uh, have another name besides... Uh, Zoomers or Millennials, that other name is Generation Rent. And uh, the generation was told that it was important to go to the university, but after they got out of the university, the earnings gap they found out between the college educated and the others had decreased and they were carrying this heavy college debt. And so it just hasn't been working. A third of the employed Britons with a degree work in non-graduate jobs. And then besides that, there are enormous number of workers that are uh, in what can be called bogus self-employment, where they're registered as self-employed but really work on a contract for one employer, like Amazon. And then also, uh, there's a big chunk of workers that work on what are called zero-hour contracts. And I don't know how you have a contract not to work, but they do. And these zero-hour contracts what they really mean is the employer doesn't guarantee them any hours in the next week and they're scheduled on an ad hoc basis and they don't know from week to work the hours that they're going to be working or the wages that they're going to be working. And to uh, copy a phrase, they're mad as hell and they're not saying we won't take it anymore, but... Uh, they're going to start saying that too, and I think uh, there will be changes that happen in the body politic. This is the next generations of voters, and uh, from what I understand, this generation of voters is more active, more politically active, uh, registering at higher rates and in voting at higher rates. And uh, I think, folks, it's going to bring changes. I actually, I'm hopeful about these changes because my opinion is that it's going to be hard to get out of our climate disaster 
uh, with exploitive capitalism as the basis of our system and it's going to take uh, this kind of energy from a uh, mass of people to move us at all on the way uh, towards this, something different. Any thoughts? It's interesting that it appeared in a British newspaper like The Guardian because as far as I know, the safety net for people in, in the UK is much wider than in the United States. But it's better there than it is here, yes. Yeah, uh, the recent, in the recent Canadian election, uh, the, a lot, the, the, everybody reported that uh, a huge issue with young people was not being able to afford a house. Yes. And yeah, it's you know they're gonna get they're gonna get really aggressive, and uh, you know bring the system down. And uh, yeah, I, I wish I'll come around to see it. <laughs> and it's not just the UK and Canada. You know, in Silicon Valley, when I left fifteen million fifteen years ago. The house that uh, was a $30,000 house uh, in the 70s was a million dollar house now. Damn. So, Richard, for our last story, tell us about the mind diet that makes us or makes our brains do better. Well, I would like to tell you if I could re just remember. Now, it turns out, uh, this is going to come as a surprise to all of you, that did you know that aging takes a toll on the body and mind? <laughs> and so uh, an appropriate question might be to ask, how can you protect your brain? For me, that's actually an issue that I care about a lot because I use my brain and I enjoy using my brain. So this is a study from the Rush University Medical Center, and I have no idea where that is. If anybody knows, please tell me. Okay, and what they are saying is adult, uh, older adults will benefit from what is called the mind diet even when they start to develop these protein deposits and plaques that you hear about as the base of Alzheimer's and dementia. So they say this mind diet protects even after you have started to have the plaques accumulate in your brain. And so that is particularly significant. The mind diet basically is a hybrid from the Mediterranean diet. We've heard of that, olive oil and fish and wine, okay. And then another diet that's called the DASH diet, the dietary approach to stop hypertension. And research has already shown that the mind diet reduces a person's uh, risk of developing Alzheimer's. But here, this study showed that uh, people on the MIND diet who followed it moderately, not extremely, then later in life did not have the same kind of cognitive problems as the other part of the group who weren't following it as closely. And so what they found that there were some people who had enough plaques and tangles in their brain to cause a problem, but they didn't have a problem. So that, to me, seems like a particular de deal. Now here, the people they are studying is a long-term study of about 600 participants that they've been studying since 1997. So this is a pretty extensive study. And uh, they have 
found, let me tell you the mind mm -hmm. diet that they had, they Hi. found the benefits from. For me? The first part was they had at least three servings a week of Oh, or excuse I, me, this is oh, of a day yeah. of whole, three servings a week of whole grains, a leafy green <laughs> vegetable, and one other vegetable every day. So eat your veggies every day in your leafy greens, along with a glass of wine, so it's not so bad. And when you snack, snack on nuts. About every other day, you should have beans and have poultry and berries at least twice a week and fish once a week. And uh, you should use olive oil. And that's pretty much it for the mind diet. One of the things that I found interesting about the mind diet is the mind diet was saying not uh, eat uh, fruit every day, but they're saying berries. Berries, uh, you know, a couple of times a week. And uh, we're in this place in one of the best berry locations in the world. So it doesn't matter if you have a, ser a fruit every day, but you need to have berries a couple of times a week. And uh, they also found that uh, what you should do is not have unhealthy foods. So that's not a surprise. Have healthy foods, don't have unhealthy foods. And the unhealthy foods that they're talking about were limiting butter to less than one and a half teaspoons a day. So you can have butter, but not much and eating less than a serving of wheat a week so less than once a week have sweets and pastries and less than once a week have whole fat cheese or fried or fast food they're not even telling you you can't have your hamburger but uh you know don't have fried or fast food and so what they found is that also with the mind diet score, those that were uh, following it moderately well, that this diet was associated with better memory and thinking skills. And the diet seemed to have a significant protective capacity and may contribute to cognitive resilience in the elderly. Uh, does everybody want cognitive resilience? I think so. So look it, look it up. Find out what the mind diet is. If you're like me, you're already eating very close to the mind diet anyway. And just look at the details and make sure you're following it. Okay? Okay, I want you to be around next week and I want you to have your mind on top of your head. Any thoughts? Yeah, I've read a lot of things on YouTube and it's all consistent with this. The more we live like hunter-gatherers, the better off we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, Clive, maybe if we continue the way we are, our, our close ancestor, our uh, progeny, will become hunters and gatherers again. <laughs> but I've uh, noticed with my uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, they eat a hell of a lot better than I did at the same age. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Richard, it seems that there's not a lot more that people are going to discuss in this today. So once again, thank you so much for doing all this. And thanks to everybody for partic participating. And we'll see you again next week. Bye for now.
Very good. See you all next week. It was good to see you and uh, good to be together again. Adios. Adios.